Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Alumbra. Um, my name is Kylie, and it is my pleasure today to introduce to you a very important topic that we're going to be covering. Before I do so, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Jara country, land of the Jar Jar Wurrung people, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Before we get into our main topic for today, I just wanted to remind all of you that if you are yet to complete your Attitudes to School survey, can you please prioritise that this week? Um, that is incredibly important data for us and it really does drive school improvement. Um, it's our main form of collecting student voice around everything to do with our college um, and we look at that data very, very closely and we make changes as needed. So thank you to the many hundreds of you who have already done that. Um, but if you did get a reminder email from Michael Lennon late last week or earlier today, um, please try and find 15, 20 minutes to get that important work done for us. Today, though, we bring you here to cover a really important topic on road safety. Um, obviously, a really big part of what we do here at the college is to prepare you for your, whether it be your exams or for work in the future, um, and we do a lot of that around the curriculum that we cover in classes. But equally important is the work that we do around the choices that you make. And you've already heard some presentations this year uh, around things such as consent and what you do around sexting and so on. Um, we've already covered quite a bit on party drugs and the influence of those. Um, and that is a beautiful segue into how important it is that the choices that you're making when you are driving or a passenger in a vehicle um, are so incredibly important and can be very much life-changing if you do make a poor choice. So it is my pleasure today to hand over to Julia from the RACV who's going to take you through this really important presentation. If at any time you do um, become distressed by the content, please be aware that our wellbeing staff are available here today and that they are out in, um, out in the foyer. So if you needed to leave, um, a member of staff will meet you out there if you do need some support. But thank you very much. If you can put your hands together for Julia. Thank you. Thank you. And how are we all? Good? OK. Quick question. Hands up. And I probably can't see the top layer up there. But hands up, who is licensed? Already? Oh, quite a few of you. OK, hands down. Hands up who's got their learners. OK. All right. So as Kylie said, my name's Julia. I'm from the RACV. I've been involved in road safety probably for about 30 years. So my work is spread across a number of different areas. Um, but I do work with post-trauma clients, so probably for about the last 20 years I've worked with young men and women that have experienced road trauma and looking at whether driving is going to be an option for them moving forward, depending on their injuries, whether those injuries are of physical nature or whether they are a cognitive nature, so in other words a brain injury. So today we're going to go through a few things, we're going to go through some road laws, uh, the main causes of collisions, the main contributing factors, and I may ask for your assistance today, so we'll see how we go with that. Okay, so without further ado, uh, here we go. So, who has seen this graph before? You, sir. What was your name? Josh. Josh. Where have you seen this before? Uh, in, the In the learner's book? Where else? Vic yeah, certainly Vic Road. Certainly you'll see it in your logbook as well. Who here is using a paper logbook? Who here is using the app? Okay, good. Excellent. All right. How do you find the app? Good? All right. So, in relation to this graph here, where's my pointer? There it is. Okay. So this area here, this is, a, this is the number of young drivers that are involved in a collision that would result in them going to hospital. So this one here, this early stage here, this is your learners. So as a learner, you are less likely to head off to be involved in a collision that results in you going to hospital than I am as a more experienced driver of 35 years. So you are safer 
than I am statistically as an experienced driver. So why is that? Why are you safer than myself? Yes? Because you have an experienced driver next to you to help you out. Okay, good. What else? Yes. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Because you're not on the road as often? You possibly, yes. What else? What else? I can't hear you. You've got your mum yelling at you? Yes, you absolutely have. Yes. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, you might take it a little easier. Yes. Yeah, it's extremely stressful, so you may take it a little bit easier from that perspective. Yes. More cautious. Um, would there be likely to be any alcohol in your system while you're sitting beside that mother that's giving you a hard time? I would say no. Are there any drugs in your system as you're sitting beside Dad whilst you're doing your learners? I suspect not. Okay. So, there's certainly elements in that learning phase um, that makes you one of the safest drivers and safer than me, statistically. So, if 30 seconds prior to your licence you are the most safest, and 30 seconds after your risk of being involved in a collision that's going to result in you going to hospital increases by 30%, what changes? What changes in that space? Yeah, you feel like more confident. I've passed the licence test. I've done 120 hours. What else? Yes. Yeah, I feel like I have more experience. What else? Okay, so let's have a look at that 120 hours. Who thinks it's way too much? Okay, so 120 hours came from Swedish research about eight years ago, and it showed that, thank you, and it showed that 120 hours of diverse, complex practice and experience um, where you're able over time to take responsibility for your own decision making um, reduces your risk by about 30% of heading off to hospital. So. Often people think, well, geez, 120 hours, that is just loads of it. So who here is heading off to a trade after this year? Who's doing a trade? Plumbing, carpentry, electrical, yes. What was your name? Sam, what trade are you doing? Carpentry, well done you. So how long's your apprenticeship, Sam? Three years, okay. So 120 hours is the equivalent to about four to five weeks of Sam being on the job as an apprentice. It's 120 hours. So would I ring Sam up and say, please, Sam, come build my home for me because I think you've got it all worked out and Sam is going? No, possibly not. Okay. Um, who here is heading off to uni? And what might you be studying at uni? Music. Okay, so contact hours for a uni course are around about 10, 15 hours a week. So 120 hours if you're heading off to your university course is around about 10, 11 weeks. What was your name, sorry? Emma. Emma? Um, of your course. So would then I contact you um, as someone that's organising a musical event, ask you to come and, and play for me? Possibly, possibly not, depending on the level of experience. Um, so what I'm getting at, though, is 120 hours is a good amount, but it only reduces your, your likelihood of being involved in a collision by, that results in you going to hospital by about 30%. So I really would like you to think about, do you want to reduce your risk by 30% or 40% or 80%? And think of that 120 hours as that minimum benchmark rather than your maximum one. Okay? Because it is only about four weeks, five weeks of Sam's apprenticeship when we look at it that way. 
So, let's move on. Young drivers. So young drivers are classified usually as under 25 years of age, okay, which I suspect you all are. You are 10% of the total driving population. Yeah. You are 23% of the total lives lost on our roads every year. You are 21%, you are one in five of the ones that are seriously injured. Now, seriously injured means that you have an impairment that will remain with you for the remainder of your days. It's not a bit of a broken leg or a sore arm. It means you'll carry that impairment for the remainder of your life. So let's have a look at it from a country, regional perspective. So, in relation to drivers that lose their lives, in the country, in regional Victoria, of which you're obviously part of that, 80% are males, 20% are females. When we look at the country Victorian space, when we look at passengers that lose their lives, what percentage do you think are young women that lose their lives as a passenger in vehicle? What do you think? More than males or less than males? 75% are young women, 25% are young men, both devastating. But it's something to think about, whether you're male or female, about what you do about getting into other people's vehicles. So if you know that the person turning up is, you know, likes to take a bit of the weed, takes a few drugs, a bit of ice, bit of ecstasy, they turn up to your place at two o'clock on Saturday afternoon. What are you going to do? Because you will need to make a choice. You will need to make a choice. So what excuses might we give that person about not wanting, not wanting to hop into that vehicle? What do we say? Sorry, I've got a part-time job I've got to go to. What else? You will need to, if you don't feel comfortable having this conversation with me here, I would like you very much to start thinking about what those excuses are that you can give about not hopping into that vehicle. Okay? Because of all the passenger deaths in country Victoria, 75% of it are women, 25% of it's men. Hospitalisations in country Victoria, now, this is in a 12-month period. So, 670 young men and women head off to hospital. 670 in regional Victoria alone head off to hospital every year. And 10% of those are serious injuries. And those are injuries that will not go away for the remainder of their life. So where does country Victoria sit in that space? Country Victoria, their, their, their hospitalisations and their, and their loss of lives, they're actually about nearly 45, 46% of the whole of the Victorian road toll. You are one third of Victoria's population. You make up nearly half of the road toll, yet you are one third of the population. So, if I had to put it in more context for you. Um, we've got 10 major country regional towns. So in relation to deaths or loss of lives on Victorian country roads, it's about three young people for every one of those 10 regional country towns. In relation to hospitalisations, it's about 60 every year young people that are required to go to hospital for every one of those country towns. And for every one of those 10 major country towns, it's about six people, six young people every year that will have an injury that will not go away for the remainder of their lives. So this is about starting to make some really, really smart decisions about what you do in those vehicles, 
whether you hop into those vehicles, and we'll go and have a look at those contributing factors. So, let's have a look. So, most common causes of collisions, what do you think they might be? Okay, here we go. Sorry? Sleeping. I missed it. Sleeping. Sleeping, absolutely. So, which comes under fatigue? Which comes under driving tired? Sorry, am I in your way there? Sorry, apologies. So, speeding. So, often we tend to think of speeding as excessive speeding. 110, 20, 130, 40 kilometres an hour, 10, 15, 20 k's in excess of the speed limit. And it is absolutely a fundamental factor in about one in five deaths and hospitalisations and injuries on the road, about one in five. So, high level speeding, if your vehicle, if you're driving within excess of 30 kilometres over the speed limit, uh, then you will receive a substantial fine, your vehicle will be impounded, and it will be up to the magistrate as to whether you receive it back or whether it's crushed. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. If you're driving your mother's car or your father's car, then that vehicle will be impounded, and it will be up to the magistrate as to whether that vehicle is crushed. I was only speaking to someone the other day that was in that exact situation. They'd taken their mother's car. They were well in excess of 30 k's over the speed limit. That car was impounded and that car was crushed. So, fatigue, as someone said, driving tired. It's a factor in about one in five, one in four, one in five collisions. So, Friday night comes. Friday morning, you get up for school. What time do you wake up? What, me? Yep, you. Uh, 9.45. 9.45, you wake up. <laughs> what time are you supposed to be at school? 11. 11. <laughs> Lucky you. What time do you wake up? Uh, 7. 7, okay. Friday night comes, or Friday day comes. You wake up at 7. What's your name? Ethan. Sorry? Ethan. Ethan. Ethan wakes up at 7 o'clock, heads off to school. Have you got a part-time job, Ethan? You have? Whereabouts? Uh, KFC. KFC, all right. So, Ethan gets up at seven, heads to school, heads off to KFC for a shift. What time do you finish? Uh, eight. Eight. And then Ethan heads off to a party. And uh, he uh, heads home from that party at about 12 o'clock. So, Ethan has been awake for 17 hours. Ethan's reactions now driving home from that party, now that he's been awake for 17 hours, is the same as someone with a blood alcohol concentration of around 0.05. Blood alcohol concentration. Now, if Ethan heads home at around about 3 a.m. in the morning, his reactions now, make sure I don't fall off, um, are the same as someone that is twice the legal limit for a full licence holder. So he has the same reactions now as someone that's about 0.1, just from being awake for 24 hours. Oh no, 20 hours, my apologies. Okay, so don't underestimate um, the impairment that comes from being awake or driving tired or being awake for that length of time. Drink driving. So, what is the legal limit for you? Zero. Not that hard, is it? It's a factor about, in, sorry, it's a factor in about one in, one in four, one in five fatalities and, and loss of lives. So what happens if you are found to be um, in excess of the legal limit, which is zero for you? Fine? You'll be summoned to court. It'll be the magistrate that will decide the penalty for you, the penalty notice, the fine, and the loss of licence that will go with that as well. So, drug driving. In relation to drugs, and we add drugs and then drink driving and then fatigue and speed, you can start to see what a cocktail of disaster this is. So in relation to drugs, 
The, te the police can um, test you on the spot on a saliva test for cannabis, uh, for ice and for ecstasy. If you look visually impaired, um, they can bring you in for a, a drug test um, at the station or at the hospital after that. Now, so in each of these, speeding, someone driving tired, drink driving, driving with drugs in your system, what are the decisions you're going to make, both as a driver and both as a passenger? How are you going to decide or have, what decisions are you going to make about hopping in that vehicle with that person? They will always be yours to make. They won't always be easy ones to make. They will not always be easy ones to make. But think about the strategies now so that you've got them for when you need to use them. Do you plan to take your own vehicle? Do you plan to stay overnight? Do you plan to have a range of excuses about not hopping in that vehicle with that person? Okay. So, actually, I'm just going to go back on this. So, in relation to speeding, there is the excessive levels of speeding. There's also what we call low-level speeding. And it is a significant contributor in relation to, to deaths and injuries. And it's that, just that little bit over. It's just that five kilometres over. It's not that much. It's just a little bit. Um, I'll see if the, the speed camera's coming up and I'll quickly whip my speed down. Um, cops give me three Ks anyway, so I should be just fine, is the excuse I often hear. This was put together by Monash University Accident Research Centre in Melbourne and I'd like you to watch it. What you're about to see will change your mind about speeding. Two identical cars, one travelling at 60, the other at 65. A sudden change in the road ahead, and both drivers first react, and then, a moment later, they brake. And things start to get interesting. Down here, the difference is extraordinary. In the last five metres of braking, you wipe off half your speed. So this car is still doing 32 k's when it hits. This one also hits, but only at five k's. So no matter how good a driver you are, five k's difference up there makes 27 k's difference down here. So if that was a pedestrian that walked out in front of you instead of the truck coming out, regardless of either way, you can see the huge difference between just five kilometres over the speed limit. The difference between a 60 and a 65 kilometre speed on those vehicles and the impact difference. So in relation to the impact for the one that was travelling 25 um, five kilometres over the speed limit, an impact speed with me as a pedestrian at about 32 kilometres an hour is sufficient enough for me to not to go home at all. And that impact speed with an extra five kilometres an hour was 27 k's. That means I've got a likely, very likely serious injury on my hands just from going five kilometres over the speed limit. It doesn't look that much on your speedo. The difference on the road is significant, is significant. So, distractions. One of the main contributing, if not the most um, significant contributing factor to, to loss of life and injuries. The brain is trying to switch between two tasks whilst it's being distracted. So what's the law in relation to... Oh, no, I won't go there. I'll go there after this. So a two-second distraction... So 1,001, 1,002, that's a two-second distraction. So the average amount of time you take to look at that phone, who's got their phone here? Who's got their phone? <laughs> no one. You are very good then. What is your school policy here? No phones. All right, okay. So if I'm looking at my phone, 
The average amount of time it takes for me to read a text, what are you doing? Do you want to catch up? Is two seconds. Two seconds. So, two seconds at 50 kilometres an hour, back residential street speed limit, you'd perceive that to be not too fast. That means I have my eyes off the road for 27 metres. So for those that are sitting down here, 27 metres is from here to your very back wall of this theatre. And for you sitting up the top, 21 metres is from that witch's hat to that witch's hat. So to take the time to read that text, what are you doing, do you want to catch up? You've travelled 27 metres in two seconds. At 100 kilometres an hour, you will travel that distance in one second. 27 metres of travel distance in one second at 100 kilometres an hour. That is a long distance. You can imagine where you position yourself in the lane and where that takes you if you leave the road. So, I'm going to do an exercise. Ooh, have I got time? Okay, who wants to come up on stage? Oh, look at the hands. Do you want to come? Come on. Come on. No? Okay, no offers? Because I won't do the exercise if I haven't. No. Okay, that's fine. So, as a substitute for that, I'm going to tell you a story. And sometimes I get upset when I tell this story. So, my niece, my niece's name was Chloe. She was 18 years and three months when the collision happened. She was a country girl from Shepparton and she was planning on becoming a kindergarten teacher. So we know from the phone records that the message that came through on Chloe's phone that day, and she was my niece, was, what are you doing? Do you want to catch up? And we know from the police records that she picked up that phone and she read that message. And she immediately responded to the text because all that information was there. She was three streets from home. She'd lived there all her life. And she proceeded through a stop sign while she was texting. Now, it wasn't like she didn't know the area. She'd driven it hundreds of times before. And she went through a stop sign and onto a major highway and the truck driver coming from Chloe's left unfortunately had nowhere to go. And he hit Chloe in his last vision, and we have remained in contact with this gentleman. Um, his last vision of Chloe was as he looked down from his cabin, was of Chloe with her phone in her hand responding to that text. Could she have decided to not pick up that phone? Could she have decided to put it somewhere where she didn't have access to it? Absolutely. So I really want you to start thinking now, because I'm going to show a video in, in a minute, um, of just where you're going to put your phones. When that app is on, when you're doing your learners, start now thinking about where you're going to put that phone. Chloe woke up that morning never knowing that that was going to be her last day. And because she picked up that phone and immediately responded to it with a text, that was her final day. So I want you to think about as friends that if you're texting someone and you know that they're driving, whether that's a good text to make. If you make that call and someone answers and you know they're driving, then you ask the question, are you driving? Yeah, fine, I'll call you back. As parents, and the teachers here in this room, when you are thinking about texting or calling your kids to see when they'll be home, think about whether they're driving at that time. Think about where you're going to put your phones. Do they go in the glove box? Do they go in the back seat? Where are you going to put them? Okay, you're going to turn them off or you're going to leave them on but out of arm's reach? Do you put the app on your phone that you activate and then it says that you're driving, I'll give you a call when I arrive? 
But Chloe lost her life for, what are you doing? Do you want to catch up? So. This was formulated by Volkswagen, and I'd like you to listen to it. happens ladies and gentlemen that's as quick as it happens and that's as quick as it happened for Chloe on that Thursday afternoon so think very very carefully about where you have your phones because if you have access to them then it's very very easy to pick them up I'm just sitting at a set of lights. I'll just pick it up. I'll tell you a story. It's, um, it was a, a family that I had some dealings with, and it was their lovely daughter. And uh, she was sitting at lights, and she did pick up her phone, and it was a text. And she read that text, and the lights changed, and the truck driver, unfortunately, thought that she was going to take off with the green light. And she didn't because she was reading her phone. So regardless of whether you think you're stationary, so therefore it's safe, um, or you're moving, or wherever the case might be, you find somewhere for that phone where you do not have access to it. Because I take a reasonable guess that even though your school policy is zero phones, I take a reasonable guess that we've got a reasonable portion of people in this room that have got phones in pockets. I take a reasonable guess. Now, I'm not pointing at anyone, but can I just ask you some questions? Sure. sure. Um, do you have your phone with you at the kitchen table? No. No, because? Don't need it. Don't need it. Do you have your phone with you? Where do you place your phone when you're doing your, you've got your licence or you've got your learners? So where's your phone in the car? Put it on silent and I just put it in the back. Well done. Do, when do you have your phone with you? Where, that's on, where it's on. Yeah, good. Fantastic. Well done. Fantastic. Ooh, where'd it go? Oh, there it went. Okay. So, I've got ten, five minutes, and I'm going to go through the latest legislation changes around phone use. Are you ready? For P1s and P2s, drivers must not use a mobile phone, hands held or hands free, for any purpose or any function under the new legislation. Any purpose or any function. You can use it if you're stationary, parked, with the handbrake on and with the gear lever in neutral or park. Okay? But you must be parked. Yes? I'll go through it. Good question. And the question was, does that mean GPS? So, for P1s, if you are caught using any electronic device whilst you are driving, um, it will not be a fine that's issued. You'll be summoned to court. The magistrate will provide the penalty or, or give you the penalty, the fine, um, and there's potentially a loss of licence with that as well. For P2s, I'll just come back in two ticks. Um, for P2s, so your Greg P's, um, it will be a fine of $433 and four demerit points for you. So how many points have you got to lose total in your P-plate period per year? Five. You are one point off then losing your licence. Yes? What about fully licensed drivers? Yep, fully licensed drivers are permitted to use their phone, provided it's in a cradle, 
and they do not touch that phone for any purpose. They can use Bluetooth. However, I'll, look at the re I'll tell you the reasons why, um, hands-free, whether it's me as an experienced driver or whether it's you. We know that if I'm using Bluetooth or I'm, using, I'm having any conversation on the phone in a vehicle, it means that the more demanding that conversation gets, the more my peripheral field of vision starts drawing in by about 30%, because my brain cannot deal with the full picture or the, feel, the full field of view. Um, I know that the more demanding that conversation gets as I'm driving, starts to impact on my reactions to the same degree as someone that's between 0.03 blood alcohol concentration and 0.08, depending on how demanding that conversation is. And we know that the more demanding that conversation gets, then we start having attention blindness. And that's when the brain, the eyes see, for example, the red light, but the brain does not process that information. That's a red light that you're coming towards. So um, there certainly has implications, even if I drive, and I very rarely drive, um, having, a, having a phone conversation, rarely. So how about music? Can I play music on my phone, whether it's connected by USB, aux cord or Bluetooth? The answer is no. You're not permitted to use your phone for any purpose or function now on your P plates. P1 or P2. OK. You're not allowed to use hands-free or any handheld device. Who here has got a smartwatch? You're not permitted to utilise those under this legislation. You touch that phone, it is the same as picking up your phone, texting, reading it, using it. Yes? What about passengers, like, using the phones and the music specifically? Like, Bluetoothing a passenger's phone? No, no. If you Bluetooth the passenger's phone, it still comes through your vehicle and you're the one driving. So the answer is no. Yep. So. Oh, descent in the racks. So, someone asked about maps, and I'll go back to what I said initially. You are not permitted to use your phone for any purpose or function, including maps, including music, including communication, texting. You can use a GPS unit that's manufactured inside that vehicle, okay? You can use um, a GPS such as a TomTom -tom or a SatNav that you place in your vehicle, you're permitted to use those. But you are not permitted to use your phone or any electronic device. Yes? What if you've got like Spotify or like music in the actual car thing? Like for a as long as you don't run it through your phone? But you're, isn't that like very similar? You're still looking at You're not permitted to use your phone. For, I'll, I'll repeat it. You're not permitted to use your phone for any purpose or any function. Not music. Not maps, not communication. It makes no difference whether your phone's in the glove box. It makes no difference whether you use it without touching it. You're not permitted to use that phone. Now, I've got a couple more minutes. If you've got any questions afterwards, feel free to ask. Happy to have the chat with you. So certainly, in relation to emergencies, yes, you want those phones with you. You want to be able to have them on and access them or turn, be able to turn them on and, and access them if you have an emergency. No one's saying that you shouldn't have your phone with you if you need it. But you have a better understanding now of the legislation and the penalties and the distractions that it causes. So, very briefly, I probably won't go through these because we're running a little bit over time, but I will go to the end. So. Major types of collisions, nose to tails. So lack of space in between you and the vehicle in front. Also distractions cause that type of collision. Leaving the lane, falling asleep, distractions, side impact with collision at, at intersections. Certainly distractions sit in there, um, unfamiliar roads, etc. So learning to drive. Now, from the show of hands, we probably had about a 70-30 mix, I think, in this room in relation to those who have their licence and those that are still learning. Um, it's not always a stress-free process.
process to learn with your folks, um, as someone attested to earlier. When Victoria picked up the 120 hours from the Swedish research, they didn't pick up the 40 hours of mandatory training that was given to every single supervisor for that piece of research in relation to 120 hours. So Victoria picked up the 120 hours, but not the 40 hours of training that would be provided for each and every supervisor. So, often parents aren't necessarily equipped for the role. So drive school instructors are a great resource. Also the Keys to Drive program. It's one free lesson, driving lesson, it's federally funded. Um, if you can go onto the Keys to Drive website, it's really easy. Name, learner permit, date of birth, and you can take the code that they give you and give it to any accredited Keys to Drive instructor. It's worth your while. They will show both yourself and your parents a way of learning whereby you better take ownership for your own decisions. You better take ownership for your own behaviours. It's a really great program. Now I'm cutting it close to time, so um, now I'm going to point to some people. And we have some free lessons to give out. How many do we have, Lydia? How many do we have? So those people that contributed, one, Ethan, where are you? Sam? Oh no, sorry, my apologies. Sam? Yep. Um, and I'll go through some others before I go. Yourself? Yeah. You can come up and see Lydia at the end. Um, and I'll think of yourself as well. Um, so thank you very, very much for your time today. I, I really, really appreciate your attention. Um, and you are, you're moving into those spaces where the decisions that you make or you don't make will be life-changing for you. So... So make the good ones. Thank you very much, Julia. Just before people leave today, um, I wanted to pass on uh, my thanks on behalf of everyone here to Julia and to the RACV for coming along and giving this presentation today. It has contained so many important pieces of information and two that have resonated with me um, that I would like each of you to think about as you go today. The first one is about using the Do Not Disturb feature on your mobile phone and making sure that there is absolutely nothing that comes through that phone that could distract you even for that one or two seconds. So please think about where your phone is going to be and have it on Do Not Disturb or on aeroplane mode so that you're not distracted. The second point that really resonated with me was that every single day we each make probably the most, the most important decision of the day is who we choose to get into a car with. You are putting your life into their hands and there will be times when your decision should be to not get in that car. And I know that there are people in this audience today that will comfortably and confidently make that decision and say, no thanks, I'm not getting in with you because I know you have taken this, I know you haven't slept, or I know that you can be a bit of a fool and be reckless when you're driving. For the, those of you that perhaps don't have that confidence or would feel really awkward, go home today, talk to your parents and carers, and you guys come up with a plan together on how you are going to get out of those situations. And I can guarantee you that almost every one of you will have a parent or carer at home that will be happy to be thrown under the bus and will be happy to be your excuse every single time. So please go home and continue those conversations. Thanks very much, everyone.